Alright, we're recording. And we're going live. Bit by bit. Fingers crossed. All the tech. Go live stream, go live stream, go. Go live stream, go. Don't know where that came from. Hi, we're live. Once again, Facebook streaming. Multi-platform streaming one day, but for now we're streaming on Facebook and we're reposting to YouTube. That's right, it's me, Moldover, your favorite person who you're watching a live stream of at this moment. Unless you're like Elvis and you got like multiple live streams simultaneously. I bet you could do that. I bet that would be pretty fun. Um, I'll say right now my bandwidth today is going wacky. So you might not even see these hand movements because it's freezing and glitching and doing all that kind of stuff. Uh, but we're going to record this whole thing. So it'll be posted after the fact and you know. Not that many people can watch live stream at one time. Anyway, how many time zones are there in the world? 24? I don't know. This is me being funny and entertaining. So what are we going to do today? We're going to talk about jam boxes. We talked a little bit about jam boxes last week on Tuesday uh, with Peter Nybor uh, from Sensel. Um, there are links. Uh, actually, there's, there's a YouTube playlist I've made of all these live streams, so you can go back and reference that one. But... Um, uh, one interesting part of that live stream was I did a little breakdown on the software side of uh, the Mini Masher. The Mini Masher is this thing behind me. Let's see if my, my camera 2 is working today. Oh, yes. Um, that over there is the Mini Masher. Um, I'm going to attempt to fly around that in a little bit. But um, yeah, we talked about the Ableton Live implementation of that and using fun MIDI controllers to make jam boxes. Um, but we talked a lot about all kinds of wacky stuff like living instruments and the sun cell morph and I can't even remember all what so um, while I've still got the mini master set up in the studio I thought it'd be cool to chat about it and um, tell you some more kind of like creative and semi-technical things about making jam boxes in general um, the broadcast is a little bit more lo-fi this week um, we sort of peaked out on comp complexity of live stream last Thursday when I did a live stream with Pyramind and unfortunately it didn't get live streamed um, which is kind of a bummer but I'm sure it'll get reposted and they're gonna do some nice post-production of that so that'll be up soon um, but I had like all my performance equipment I had the nice microphone and I had these lights in a more intelligent and attractive location and what's up Kimberly Davis welcome to the live stream um, so that was just like overload and it, it was like an hour doing all the tech check for that and I had spent multiple hours preparing all the content for it and whatnot. So yeah, today I just want to keep it relatively simple and so you're you're getting uh, a little bit more of a raw live stream. So um, yeah, so I'll show you some of the Jambox stuff. Um, let me uh, let me take you over there. So this is the dangers as we, as we move around with the laptop or bandwidth changes. We're gonna get a we're gonna get an Ethernet connection in the near future. That's my plan anyway. Um, and then we can we can go more reliably live in all places, not just the studio. We can even go to the live in the workshop. That would be interesting. So check it out. This is the Mini Masher. I'm just gonna plunk the laptop down over here. Welcome to my studio. If you haven't been to my studio before, this is it. It's a uh, it's a fun place. I'm fortunate to have it. And. Uh, Current circumstance, and I should begin by, as uh, Peter said last week, paying, paying attention to the elephant in the room, which is yes, we're all stuck at home, hence more live streaming, hence me trying to create interactive and entertaining content for you from the privacy of my own home, as opposed to stages and uh, other public venues around the world. So, all right, let's go to camera two here. Yeah, I have fun with this. So this is the Mini Masher, and we gave you a little tour of it last week. It's a three-sided jam box. It is uh, the third bespoke jam box I've designed. Um, been in process for quite a long time. Uh, what are jam boxes? Jam boxes are multiplayer musical instruments, and I'll actually show you pictures of a few. You don't want to see that streaming page. Uh, going back in time, real quick, uh, you will see, oh wait, this is totally not chronological. But anyways, this is a website I made called jamboxes.net, which is kind of a quick and dirty 
collection of all <clears throat> of these devices that I've come across in my day. So here you'll see the very first jam box I made. This one's called the Octomasher, eight-sided thing uh, made with musical keyboards. Down here is the Cinco Masher. This is the second one I made, a uh, five-sided one, um, inspired by the Mojo, making some pretty crazy ergonomic future-ish interfaces um, all connected together. Um, I have jam boxes from other people. This is like a super crazy ambitious one that landed at Burning Man one year called Sizzy Grid. This is one that was productized by some super amazing smart people in Barcelona. It's called React Table. Um, there's great jam boxes for your iPad, or at least there's one called Cotrax, which is pretty awesome. It's like a morphable one where you can play with just yourself or up to four people, as you can see in that photo. Um, events, other jam boxes by me, like the Launchbox, the Orbit by DJ Tech Tools, Connect Table, um, the Octomasher, which is now in Ottawa again. <laughs> so yeah, there's a whole bunch of these things, and I've been inspired to um, share and create and make these things, mostly because it's an opportunity to take all the super fun tools that I developed for performing with technology, performing music with technology, which are often designed to make it easier and more fun and more expressive to make music. Um, but I usually perform solo, so it's kind of cool to have an alternate multiplayer experience to share um, and to let other people share. And it's also cool to make things um, that are more, more casual than the like rather refined performances that I tend to do, which involve a lot of um, rehearsal and you know, composing and stuff like that. And these are more the, the fun side, just jamming and having fun. So let me give you a quick little tour of the Mini Masher. And in case you didn't tune in to the Sensil thing last week, it's three-sided. It's got three sets of drum pads. This one plays drums. This one plays bass. Sorry, the sound is probably the sound is probably not up to your standards right now because you're just hearing my laptop mic. But this one plays keys. And each one has a, an XY pad associated with it, so it'll alter multiple characteristics of what it does. So this keyboard one, this one starts an arpeggiator. Let me set my camera up here. Oh, this is actually an ideal camera situation. The fisheye coming in handy. How's that? You see? My hands. The mini masha. So the bass has got like some filtery thing. And the drums over here. You can't see my XY pad, but it's got this stuttering, filtering kind of thing. Um, so yeah, that's the gist of how it works, and fun, later on the show today, I'm going to have my dear friend and guest, Rich DDT, who created one of the three sound sets for it, and this is a feature I didn't actually get to show you on the live stream with Peter Nyboy, but there's three complete sound sets, so you just twist this knob to your favorite artist, like Rich DDT, and a whole new set of sounds is in there. Different tonality. multiple sounds, some stabs, and, and kind of a roadsy kind of thing. And yeah, so that's an overview of like how it works. Um, we're going to bring Rich on, and, Rich on a little bit later to talk about what it's like to make sounds for someone else's jam box. He's also made a bunch of jam boxes of his own, so he can talk about that stuff. But I wanted to give you some technical details on like how this thing came to be, because a lot of people see my inventions, and they're like, wow, that's super cool. And most of them are even more inspired when they learn a little bit about how I make them, because as an independent artist, it's kind of an interesting process. I get to like come up with crazy weird stuff uh, in my head and bring it into being. So the Mini Masher was actually born in 2009 um, in San Francisco, the year after I'd moved here. And there was a small party in the city, and I built it mostly out of spare parts. The one thing that was like nice and finished was um, this top piece which has actually been remade, but this originally was a piece of laser cuts, 
uh, acrylic. Acrylic is uh, often called um, plexiglass, but it's um, basically a plastic that's thin. Uh, or sorry, it's not thin. It's uh, it's uh, it's forgiving. It's uh, it's easy to cut with a laser. Laser cutters are a really cheap um, rapid prototyping device, comparatively cheap compared to some of the rapid prototyping devices that are out there these days. Uh, but laser cutter cutters are common in a lot of workplaces that need to design things, and also in hacker spaces and maker spaces, which you'll find in every major city in the country and all over the world, really. So yeah, you can probably get your hands on a laser cutter and get somebody to help you cut something like this. So you can just draw whatever you want with a vector drawing program. Laser will cut acrylic for you. And yeah, it's, it's uh, cheap and easy to make custom parts with acrylic. I was also interested in working with acrylic because I had made uh, face plates for the Octomasher with acrylic. I went over here, some of the cool things. The studio. This is one of I think maybe the second generation acrylic face plates from the Octomasher. This one has been etched. I don't think the etching is really easy to see. It's like really reflective in this room right now. Um, but anyways, this is my first um, experience working, working with acrylic, and yeah, it was pretty easy. I wanted to do vector drawing um, with that process, and I was like, oh, it'd be cool to like make a whole um, jam box using it. And also I wanted to make it clear because like I thought the guts of this would be really interesting if people could see the insides, like how the whole thing worked, it would kind of expose what's going on. And a lot of people like see these devices that I've made and um, especially the jam boxes, and like what's in there, what's going on, I want to know. And this is when I can just be like, oh look, <laughs> there's a Mac Mini, there's a car stereo amplifier. And it's um, it's kind of cool, it gives it this kind of educational aspect and this really kind of weird future-y tech uh, look. Um, so what is in there? These are core pad controls. These are actually like a really fantastic uh, pad controller that came out in sort of like the early generation of USB MIDI controllers. So they're really affordable. Um, I think they're like 200 bucks um, in the beginning retail. But what's great about them is that it have lights, so you get a little bit of visual feedback. Um, they go into this nice default attract mode. If you don't touch them for like five minutes, they start doing these fun patterns. Um, track mode and um, they're relatively hackable right so this little touchpad is like a separate component that used to live over on this part of the circuit board that's kind of covered up by this label that I made um, but yeah um, it was relatively easy to like take it apart remove all the knobs it still works without all the other components all I wanted were the pads and then the XY uh, touch sensor so yeah it was very hackable and very easy to work with and it's a very responsive controller, so it's very musical. Um, so there's three of those in there, obviously, and these little touch pads are mounted separately. What else is in there? That is indeed a car stereo. That's probably the third or the fourth amplifier that's gone in there. Um, and I just wanted, a lot of these things I just do kind of as educational things for me. It's like, I want to try working with a new material or a new manufacturing technique. I want to learn you know, vector drawing. And this one, this is like the ultimate experiment in panel mounting. This is just a way of putting components in a box, right? In this case, I think it's panel mounted. There's little screws on everything. The, the pads, the uh, touch sensors, the speakers, the little pillars inside that are even panel mounted that connect the top to the bottom of the device. So this was, this is like one like super, super complicated um, panel. And I don't know, I was just going bonkers with that whole concept. Um, and in this case, it was like, oh, I don't know what kind of amplifiers to put in these things. Like you can buy like, home stereo amplifiers that are kind of okay, but they're not usually very compact, they're not usually very durable, um, and really like car stereo components and also like boat components. You can buy like stereos just for your boat, uh, sound system just for your boat. They're extremely durable, and significant differences are that um, some of them are actually already multi-channel. Like a cool thing about this one is it's a four-channel amp, so that's one thing is if you're buying these home stereos, uh, little amplifiers or whatever, they're usually two channels left and right, and so if you got like, I do in some of my instruments, like eight or six different speakers, and we want to set all their levels um, to be the same, it helps to have a multi-channel amplifier, but you just don't find six or eight channel amplifiers out there. So, um, yeah, uh, you do in the car stereo world. So this is a four-channel amplifier, and it's great for the three speakers um, that I have here in the Mini Masher. Um, it's kind of heavy, which I don't I think it's awesome, but it's also powerful, and it's great. That's power supply for the Mag Mini, which is in here, you'll see somewhere. That's a power supply for the car stereo. That's the downside, is it needs to run off of like a whole bunch of uh, 
all about juice, I think. You know, something common in cars, but not so much in your things that are plugged in the wall. And over here, a little USB hub in there. Two blue lights, and behind it is the Mac Mini. And if I can get the laptop a little closer here, we get over to the panel. I'm proud of that. That was um, an update. And so I should mention, like, this thing came to be over, like, many, many years. Um, sadly, like, I keep talking about, like, oh, this is inexpensive, and that's inexpensive. But, like, this thing has been, um, I can't say all over the world, but all over the U.S. It's been to, um, it's definitely been to Burning Man. It's been to um, South by Southwest. I made this custom road case so I could, like, fly with it. It's called the Mini Masher because it's comparatively small and compact compared to other NAND boxes, um, but it still weighs, uh, I think, 30 pounds on its own or 35 or something like that. So you can't say it's light. It's like 70 pounds? I don't know. You can check it on the airplane uh, in the road case, um, but it still just sucks to fly with stuff. I'll just say that as an aside. But um, anyways, this is one of the many upgrades that happened over the years because I wound up in situations where I want to connect it to a larger external sound system. So having the three uh, channels of high frequency content, like basically the three stations on the top, and the subwoofer as separate little audio outputs that you can break out here is really useful. Um, this video output is really useful if you want to like work on the sound inside. So this is a little extension EGA connector that goes to the, the Mac Mini that's stuffed in there. And this USB jack is just a exposing another USB jack on the computer, and that's useful because I've set it up so you can just plug in this specific MIDI controller, which I don't have at the moment, but it's like a, a little Behringer thing covered with knobs and faders. I have it set up to be a mixer, so if you want to like just change the volume or whatever, um, but you don't want like you know, the public, this is often set up as an installation where anybody can just walk up and play it. Um, uh, often like you want to be like the curator of the exhibit and be able to control the volume, turn it down, you know, when the wedding ceremony happens or whatever and uh, turn it back up afterwards. So you just plug in that controller by that USB port and you can change the volume and everything. And that's also where you can plug in a mouse and a keyboard. So um, you can have the whole computer connected without having to open up the box. Um, what else can I tell you about it? Um, it is no longer acrylic. Acrylic is actually pretty fragile stuff. And there's, there's one little injury. There's an example of how acrylic tends to fracture and <laughs> feel bad showing you one of the like, defects in the device. Um, because I recently like, overhauled the whole thing and clo uh, cleaned it up. And this is now a polycarbonate top, which is extremely durable. It's much harder to uh, work with. You need something like a CNC router. You can't use a laser cutter because it puts off toxic fumes if you burn polycarbonate. Um, but this is what they make, if I'm not mistaken, this is what they make bulletproof glass out of. So this stuff is inc incredibly durable. And this particular sheet has anti-scratch coating on top of it. Uh, I think it's also UV coating. So now the top is super durable. The bottom is made out of the same material and it's pretty it's pretty awesome. Hey Larry, what's up? How you doing? Welcome to the live stream. Just checking in on the on the chat here. Oh, there's all kinds of people. B1 is here. What's up B1? Sianna. Arpeggiator is a fun word. I wish there was more opportunities to use arpeggiator. <laughs> well, thank you. I can't really believe it is well made. I'm very proud of it. So other fun things. I'm, I'm not moving fast enough because I want to get our special guest on here. This is a really nice subwoofer. It's, uh, yeah, it's black, so it looks it looks nice. I put a custom back piece on it so you can't mess with the volume. And uh, let's see, you know, have a screwdriver handy. So, um, and that's made for, it's a KRK sub, so it's made for your, like, home studio production needs. And um, gets really good sound. It's really compact. Very attractive, and uh, yeah, it's also sitting on this custom table um, that I made with a local San Francisco artist who's now moved to Portland. Everyone's moving to Portland, um, but yeah, this is a beautiful CNC routed uh, blowtorch finished um, table with like a cool spiral. I don't know if you have a light in there and see this well, but there's a cool spiral design on it. Um, it's got potentially collapsible; doesn't come apart and get together. Super easily, so I try to keep it in one piece, but it is a beautiful piece of furniture. And um, yeah, I'm not sure there's a whole lot else to tell you about the Mini Masher. On the hardware side, um, check out the, the, the 
the thing I did, the stream I did last week on Tuesday with Peter Nyboy from Sensel. If you want to know about the, the software side of it, um, I think Rich JT is going to talk about that a little bit too. But basically, I used Ableton Live, which I use for all my kind of quick prototyping, make a thing that sounds awesome and is super fun to play quickly projects, which is so many of my projects. And um, yeah, I'll also say, oh, it's a good time to plug things. I totally forgot. Um, you can buy this. Um, I've sold two jam boxes in the last few years, and uh, yes, we're liquidating them. All jam boxes must go. <laughs> Maybe not all of them, um, but yeah, people uh, like me don't always have tons of time to like bring this to my festival or share it with my friends at my house party or who knows what. I know we're not doing a lot of that in this time of social distancing, um, but uh, yeah, if you're interested in this mini masher, um, but yeah, it's a good piece of art. Uh, in addition to a super fun musical instrument. Uh, I just wanted to mention this because it's sitting over here. I'm not going to say anything about it, but this is the 8-bit boombox. It's a super fun jam box too. I might play with other jam boxes in the future, but since we're doing a jam box breakdown, I thought I would talk about that one at least a bit. Um, yeah, so without any further ado, I'd like to bring on my special guest, Rich CDT. Switch over to uh, guest view here. Rich, have you been hanging out patiently? Is your audio unmuted? How are you today? Uh, oh. I'm doing pretty good today. Yeah. yeah. Excited to focus my mind on all of the wonderful ways to make music with other awesome people, musicians and non-musicians alike. Um, and super grateful to have learned so much from you, Moldover, in terms of how to design these amazing works of art, multiplayer music instruments, and cultural movement to really open up the world of electronic music to a wider audience. Um, yeah. So oh, it's, it's been flatter me, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's been largely due to you. I talk about bringing these things to parties and events, and it is often you who is organizing or co-organizing set parties and events and um yeah we've had a collaborative history that goes back how long now i know 2008 when i moved here and that's uh that's roughly when we started love tech right 2009 january 2009 was the beginning of love tech but we met at burning man um a couple of years before that and started we you have you were teaching at ableton workshop so that was our first intro <laughs> yeah yeah so we've been we've been collaborating for a long time doing event stuff for a long time and um yeah, I don't know if it's easier to talk about your jam boxes first, or if you want to talk about making music uh, uh, sounds, presets, or whatever for the Mini Masher. Um, yeah, well, we've already touched on the Mini Masher, um, which has that like 16 pad design, a little bit like you see on my shirt here. Yes. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the design is really cool. It's so simple. I think it captures a real sweet spot of very approachable, easy to play, and it lets you go deep too, especially if you're a musician, an instrument that's more expressive style, and smash your hands on things and it, it will sound pretty good. It, it's it got that range to it. And it was really what ushered in, I think, a new era of multiplayer music instruments. Um, so I, I was so excited. Easy to work for. So I'm having some bandwidth problems. Could you? I apologize to all our live stream attendees out there. We are recording this so that at least the live recording should be vastly improved. But could you repeat that last sentence for me? Apologies. Oh, sure. Yeah, I was just diving into what it was like to work with the Ableton set, the template that you provided. Um, you know, it's really awesome to be able to build a musical instrument that has a variety of sounds from a bunch of different music producers. And um, I think the template that you made was very straightforward and easy to work with um, and works really well for uh, both building custom instruments and uploading samples into. So for example, let's look at the uh, beats. So the beats section, those are all uh, clips in Ableton, four to eight bars long typically. Did, I, did the session I pass you open? Is it possible to share? Did. Share a little bit uh, of that? 
Yeah, I can totally share that. Let me do a screen share. Um, you can also see a little bit of the same thing uh, on uh, here at our previous interview with the Sentinel Morph. Um, are you guys uh, seeing Ableton here? Is that visible? Uh, I'm seeing Ableton, yes. I'm going to try and blow that up so our viewers can enjoy it a little more easily. Cool. Um, but yeah, go go ahead. Oh, yeah. So um, the section here, this is the drums. You can see I uh, just closed, open that group. Um, just a, zooming out a little bit, you see there's V1, DDT, and Moldover. So we're the three different artists that are on this version of the minimum. Um, so yeah, drums is the most straightforward. It's really cool. It uses a clever design that allows all of the drums to stay in sync. And that basically is having them all play back um, all of the proper beat and bar. Uh, so they're always in sync with each other. And what you're doing when you're pressing the pads is you're unmuting the relevant drum track. Um, I don't have any of the samples actually loaded up here, um, but basically each of these switches to a different drum loop. Um, and I was a 10 VPN for all that. And there's cool effects on there as well. Yeah, cool. That's um, the lead section uh, was pretty straightforward as well. Um, that was the uh, my best friend, Electric. So Ableton's native device, Electric, the keys patched there, which I basically adapted straight from my performances using the control guitar. It's the guitar-like instrument that I made. Um, yes, so the control guitar. Yes, classic instrument that's evolved a whole bunch. Um, and I just took my favorite and sound and put it in there for the leads so that the pads press different notes and then the, uh, the XY pad arpeggiates them. Um, same format as Moldover. And then the bass was a little bit more complex. Instead of having all 16 pads be like different notes, I had two groups of uh, eight. So it was basically like two bass instruments in one, which makes it a little bit unique in terms of a patch. Uh, you can see here, I use mostly operators and tension. Um, We've got this group here is the lower bass notes using a mix of tension and operator. And then the upper eight pads were the two other operators, this bass plays and another operator as well. Um, and that made good sound. And there was a really nice uh, wobbling effect uh, when you touch the XY pad. Um, and it was fun, like getting to actually uh, jam with the instrument um, yeah, I was going to ask, how was the hardware, like, having that in front of you? Because I didn't mention to people, but <clears throat> if you watch some of the videos I have about the Mini Masher on YouTube from back in the day, it says, like, oh, I was going to have, like, all these different artists do content for it, and um, the things I ran into were, like, one, like, collecting content from artists and, like, whatever format they had, you know, made their album or their sound pack or whatever, and then trying to reformat it for the Mini Masher was, like, a whole bunch of work. And number two, like trying to help them understand at a distance, like kind of how the interaction works and how much, for example, like uh, the XY, like the, the little effects that you add to the instrument, like how much that is a part of, you know, the sound. And I can't just like take a bunch of like, you know, drum sounds and throw them in there and have it be fun. Um, so I ran into all these problems getting artists to create content for it. So that's one of the reasons I went to you and was like, hey, like, can you learn the instrument can you appreciate like how it works on a deeper level deeper level and use that knowledge to make your sounds um was that was that crucial <laughs> to be able to sit there with the hardware was it easy was it difficult yeah there's some basic things like okay you, you move your finger across the xy pad what range is the really the sweet spot for the effects mm. okay to that real time um and also the sound quality is very different on these speakers so you can do it in your home studio but really being with the instruments and hearing how to tune the sounds with the right rever reverb and compressor to get it tweaked nicely for that sound system. But also, even more importantly, where the couple times I got to jam on it with other people and really feel how the sounds responded to that real play testing. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, and that's from that, I, I remember playing the bass and thinking, oh, I want more than one voice here. But how am I going to get more than one voice? So I just split it in half, and that was a fun discovery during the jam session. Um, but yeah, it was key and getting to, you know, live close mold over and make it happen in hardware uh, myself and V1 also uh, made the awesome patch 
himself as well. And yeah, it was great. Um, and I think it can also work remotely too with other artists, um, just, you know, tuning up on the back end for making things work, but getting it out there, like the connect table platform that Moldover started as well for uh, getting this template around to artists so they can all try this format, I think is really exciting, especially as more jam boxes are coming out and um, really glad that I got to build several of my own Beyonds too. Um, oh, and also we've been getting these out to the people. Uh, so we we're talking about starting Love to, um, mostly started at the party ran ourselves. Um, and one of the more unique things about it was this digital jam session that would break out in our interactive art zone. So these instruments, these- um, the Jam so lounge. You should tell yeah, people about the legendary jam lounge. <laughs> The Jam Lounge has evolved to like uh, jam session groups that we will um, we'll start actually doing some live stream versions real soon that have some like low latency audio uh, for real time jamming. Oh, um, online, online uh, quarantine jams. Exactly, quarantine jams are coming real soon. I'm working out the latency with different platforms to make sure it's it's good for really hearing each other quickly uh, cool. for real time. Um, but yeah, I was basically mentioning that these jam boxes have gotten out there um, as rentals as well. So we've taken these instruments to a variety of conferences and events and organizations. Um, as the people are getting more feedback, tuning instruments, really lighting people up with the ability to make a really awesome musical experience, whether or not they've ever touched a musical instrument before. It's this feeling of creating an instant band with your friends or completely strangers. And uh, that came to a real peak, I think, uh, with the momentum of the jam boxes soon after the Minimasher when we did our tech museum uh, reboot music exhibition, which Moldova was a key part of. John Bryan co-curated that with me, where we had 16 multiplayer music instruments like this in the exhibit. And that, it was really fantastic. Um, yeah, it, that was amazing. I mean, the, the fact that you brought together so many artists all over the Bay Area and had that running for like six months, I think it was. That, that was a thing for me too, because most of the places that had these instruments featured up to that point uh, were either like low pressure, like it's running at somebody's house or warehouse or gallery or something for a while, uh, or it's at a festival for like three days where it's getting like played by a bunch of people, but you had to make all these exhibits that were gonna run for like months on end, right? With other people like as the caretakers, like what was that process like? <laughs> In that process, um, we learned a lot about how to make these things sustainable long-term. How do you have these uh, reliable startup routines on all the installations? Uh, so you can just pull the plug and plug them back in and have them auto boot and, re and do all of the appropriate launching of all the scenes and also make it robust in the physical world. So when people pour a can of soda into it, <laughs> it- uh, The mini masher yeah, it went down. It was not, well, did, did it go down? One of the pads went down with the, with the soda. It got stuck in the stickiness. You had to like do a deep clean on it at some point. <laughs> yeah. See, that's the, the, the double-edged sword of the, uh, the horizontal interface. It's like nowhere to put your drink. I'll just put my drink right here. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I, a lot of the designs I've had have been more pyramid shaped. <laughs> so you yeah, can't put your too. drink up. It, it's, uh, Pyramids are harder to build though, right? Have you found that? <laughs> Found what? The pyramids are harder to build. It's true. Yep. Definitely easier to build jam Talk boxes more. than jam pyramids. Um, oh, oh, I think we're having a little bandwidth hiccup. Yeah, we're going to we're going to Ethernet next stream. Everyone can't be having this, this glitchiness. You still there, Rich? You still with us? I feel like a newscaster. Can you hear me? Uh, I'm sure it'll come back. Oh, it's coming back. This is like tense moments. I'm sitting here watching this little bandwidth meter and it's like red, it's yellow. Cool. Uh, red, yellow. <laughs> yes. Uh, I see something. Um, cool. Oh, what's that? Is that the whole tech exhibit? I can see your images, but the audio is a little glitchy. 
So this looks like yes, I every single. Yes, I to just give a quick preview. Um, oh, oh, and we're we're down. Reconnecting, reconnecting. So stand by. Our guest will be back with us soon. That's unfortunate. He's about to show you some of the some of the stuff from the. Oh, there you are. You're back. All right, reconnecting. Oh, stand by. Do you? This is great. I feel like I'm talking to like a robot in the future. I have all these powerful <laughs> video conferencing you... software in front of me on a laptop that is too old for its own good. <laughs> can you hear my voice still? Is my voice coming through? I can hear you now. You're sounding good. Okay. That's good. I'm still working on getting your video back. Okay, that's cool. Well, you can hear me. Um, I'll just mention that the exhibits featured awesome instruments that weren't just about buttons and knobs. Like We really wanted to expand the dimensions of human expression, so that meant creating gestural interfaces that detected how you move your hands in the air. Uh, there were ones that responded to breaking beams of lasers. There were ones that had uh, capacitive touch. There were ones that had RFID. And you know, one thing that's really cool is once you get to redefine what a musical instrument is, then you can really build it in a custom, unique way that can really inspire people to think out of the box for how they create music. Um, so, yeah. yeah. I mean, each one of these is a unique instrument unto itself and really awesome how much opportunity you created for artists to explore this kind of new, new untapped ideas. I mean, because that's, that's one thing that got me excited about all these devices is like uh, just this like unexplored potential. I mean, I, uh, I've done plenty of interaction with the sort of like professional music manufacturing world and one of the things that gets me down about it is like they tend to only you know produce designs that can be marketable marketable and it's only like one in a hundred or a thousand instruments you know that kind of comes to market and becomes affordable for people and easily accessible for people to order in in the music instrument manufacturing industry um it's just like you don't get to see all these cool amazing ideas um of what musical instruments could be and you just created this opportunity for a whole bunch of instrument makers and artists to like totally explore that and explode that and that was really remarkable let's do it again yes i'm stoked collaborator uh, uh i can go other to about specific other time i can do that um, my bandwidth is still struggling today. Um, so I think you were talking about showing some more stuff, and I think you should. I think this is way more interesting than me talking about stuff in my studio. So whatever you're going to show, please show. Okay. Um, so, yeah, you're looking at... ...a bunch of culture... There's no things that don't necessarily make music, but uh, the music ones are my favorites. And um, some of them in here were created for the uh, Tech Museum, which is now called the Tech Interactive. So you can see here, Scribble Scratch. This is like one of the most basic ones where we want to give people a taste of what it means to DJ. So you see a zoomed in waveform here, and you're basically just feeling what it's like to scratch samples. And, uh, you get to play with reverse and forward and the speed of the scratch. So it's, it's really honed in on what it means to mix music as a DJ, uh, at least the beat matching and sample play part. And uh, that was a really cool collaboration that involves deconstructing a DJ controller that has like motorized um, turning platters and uh, stripping away all the things you don't need and revealing only what you do, which is an important aspect of design. Make it the most simple, direct, and accessible interface, so you're not overwhelmed with too many options, and you just see 
the parts that are really fun. Um, this was the one that I made uh, like right before working on the mini masher, um, which is similar. It has like four sections instead of three. Um, the extra part here is the microphone, which lets you do auto tune vocals. Um, and so that has some shared uh, design with the connect table. Uh, this is another piece of Moldovers, um, which has the uh, combo of playing back these samples, um, basically the loops on one layer, and then you accompany those samples by playing the keys, or in the case of the read matrix, the buttons. So accompanying backing tracks, it's like a very common way that people will perform. So that's one of the great aspects of the love tech environment. You see a really cool performance on stage, you're like inspired. How does that one person make all these sounds happen? And then you get your hands on how to do it with some of these examples using instruments that the artists have built using samples that they've made. Um, voice box is another really cool one. It's all about the vocals. Uh, you've got this beautiful table that shows um, a spectrogram. It's a 3D spectrogram of your voice and your partner's voices uh, displayed there. And the buttons apply a bunch of different really cool effects, both buttons and XY pad to create a new musical kind of conversation. Um, that one also based on uh, a Mac mini running Ableton. Um, there's some really awesome ones like the oscillation station. Uh, this one is just a single player version that you see Daniel Berkman jamming out on. Um, this one is going multiplayer real soon. So I'm very excited about how this is developing because it's, it's both sound and light. You have these awesome, um, carefully designed sounds that look great in a vector environment such as an oscilloscope or some other fun toys like lasers and, and, and game stations. So there's gonna be a lot so, happening with the oscillation station really soon. So I don't wanna derail you, but I'm, I'm kind of curious your thoughts. I'll kind of bring this back to the current moment if it's all right, which is with a question yeah. about, um, yeah, this, this new world that we're entering where, um, you know, all these projects generally find a place at live events and with hands-on interaction, right? They're interactive art, they're things that people get their hands on, and ideally they're people, things that people interact together with in a room, and I know like you've even created, you created way more of these kinds of things, uh, you know, reaching into like visual art and um, yeah, just more multimedia stuff, and you even have pieces that like people actually need to touch, and it's like, uh, capacitive censoring of, you know, multiple people touching each other that, like, activates the art, like, where do you think we are going to land, <laughs> uh, you know, as this whole yeah. crisis plays out? I'm sure you've been thinking about that like I have. Oh, totally. I mean, eventually people are going to touch physical interfaces again, but in the meantime, it's all about um, the devices that we already have or new devices that we can order, which have synchronistic feedback uh, across the internet. So, um, there's a ton of really iOS apps out there already. Uh, uh, Playground is probably one of the most polished ones that I've seen that does a really great sample, uh, does a really great job juggling like very cleverly quantized samples with excellent, excellent sound design for multiple artists. Um, so being able to use your tablet, your phone to have uh, over the internet jam with friends in real time, solving all the low latency issues. For that, um, I see that as the immediate version of the jam box. Um, Have you played with the Tim Exiles you know, new app, Endless? Oh, not yet. <laughs> is it really cool? It is, yeah. It's got like a larger vision, but it's very much in the jam box kind of space and it's pretty compelling design. It's Endless with three S's. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, and so alternatives in an economy for uh, remote jam sessions. Um, there's also the possibility of manufacturing custom parts and shipping them to people. Um, and also having, you know, the AP box is a great example. So giving people the chance to get playful with 
physical interfaces so they have their own side of the jam box streaming from their own home um, and that can be done through a number of ways i mean there can be um similar to how there's the ableton's and to it could be maybe a distributed a distributed max project that has some simple parameters um there's i think there's a lot of right territory for exploring what it means to set up your own custom controller to add to the jam um and the first step will be it's got a default app-based format and you can plug in a usb compliant device for a tactile feel for the controls to either augment or replace that you know touch screen version mm. um, yeah. i like that but tactile more, controllers yeah. are definitely my preference yeah, and I've I've really loved with Metro recently because one of my favorites is like keeping each other comes to a Tiscus revolution, for example. Um, you can use uh, these really great plating processes to turn any object you want into uh, a conductive control surface. So there's a lot of excitement coming for. Yes, Neat. excitement. Our stream is a little bumpy today. Well, I think I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap up things with our guests, Rich. I'm sure you're. I hope you're still hearing me. Um, I apologize for technical difficulties. It's ironic that they're happening on the, the low pressure stream, um, but this is the world we're living in, and um, that's how it goes. Uh, thank you so much, Rich, for joining us. I'm going to, yeah, it looks like the yeah stream has dropped there. But we're still recording, so um, what can I tell you guys? Ooh, ding dong. Hey, Rich, I was just... Uh, questions. Deep uh, questions for me or you? Still there, Rich? All right, we're gonna we're gonna retire that section of our programming, and uh, yeah, big thanks to Rich for joining me today, enhancing our conversation about jam boxes. I hope you enjoyed seeing inside my jam boxes. Rich had a lot of great info to share about his jam box designs. I am so glad to see him um, getting those all documented and organized up on the websites. Lovetech.org uh, is where you can check out more Rich's stuff. I believe he also has richddt.com. Um, or if you just Google richddt, you will surely find him and his amazing works. And uh, a bunch of mine, too, because we work together. So, yeah. Um, I think that's all for today's live stream. Thanks for tuning in. We're going to keep it somewhat short and sweet. Um, I'm going to mention real quick that uh, I'm doing a soldering workshop. A week from Thursday on April 23rd where it's a hands-on thing and today is the last day where you can order one of these kits to get it to you in time for the hands-on light theremin soldering workshop that we'll be doing on April 23rd. Um, on this Thursday we have another live stream. It's going to be another casual situation. Um, we'll work on getting some more stable bandwidth so you can enjoy uninterrupted holdover live streams just what you've always wanted. And um, yeah, many thanks to all of you in the chat and all of you tuning in. And this will be up um, on YouTube and Facebook for your enjoyment at a later time. Thank you for tuning in.